Welcome back to another episode of Bergeron Briefs. My name is Art Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, as many of you know, I do these shows as interviews to really complement the presentations that I do at the uh, Ashland Senior Center. Um, and the purpose of this is really to talk about in, more in depth about issues that really don't work in a seminar context where you really want to try to understand more fully a particular issue or what a particular person does. And one of the presentations that we have done in the past is we've done presentations on family feuds. We've talked about those issues that are typically the places where controversy usually happens around an estate, uh, around a guardianship, these types of issues. Um, and I wanted to talk to somebody very special regarding those issues because she's local, among other things, my friend Trish Davidson, who works with me at um, Myrick O'Connell. Um, and one of the things that she specializes in and has for many years has been family feuds. Because I've always talked to people and said, you know, when I was practicing by myself as a, as a sole practitioner with one partner, the family feuds were always the things that I dreaded because I wasn't doing it all the time, which really made me a bad representative in a family feud situation because I just wanted to get the case settled because the last thing I wanted to do was to go to court. So now at Myrick O'Connell, I find I have a couple of people, but specifically Trish Davidson, who loves arguing with people and <laughs> fighting and family feuds. And so now I can just say, you got problems, we'll let you talk to Trish. So Trish, we're going to talk today. Well, you and, know, Arthur, it's not always fighting. It's about trying to solve the problem. And sometimes to solve the problem, you have to go to court. But and someti sometimes but you have to fight a little bit. But, but sometimes you just get those grumpy people who like fighting, you know, and that's, that's kind of the way it is. Right? Well, in the family feud area, there's yeah. a lot of emotion because it involves family and who hasn't had some issues with the family over right. the years. Right. It's right. about what parent liked who best. It's about how siblings got along, not only now in their adulthood, but what happened generations ago. Yeah. It's about your sense of fairness. It's about your sense of entitlement. It's about your sense of um, am I being treated in accordance with the, the law? Do I have misplaced expectations? So it's, it's all that stuff that merges with the legal issues involving wills and trusts. Right, right. And I know that every, well, as we always tell our clients, every case is different. That's why you try to focus on different, you, know, you need to focus on the specifics of a particular sure, case. Sure. On the other hand, for us old people, you went well. For for me, as an old lawyer, right? yeah, you're, just, you're still one of those young. You're people. just hitting your stride. Just, you're just still one of those young people. To, so you you start finding some common themes that show up, right? That's true. Uh, from case to case, and I know we've talked about some of these, uh, you know, on occasion, and I've mentioned this at, at these at seminars, but from all of the cases you've seen, you've seen a lot, right? Can you talk about what you would say are the most common sources of contentiousness and maybe give us a couple of examples sure. of that kind of feud and maybe we can just kind of talk about that more right because I know from from my perspective I still remember because I'm so old right this old ad for uh, I think it was a muffler couple called Amco and the theme was you can pay us now or you can pay us later right. and I always tell clients you know the, the 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 result ideally of good planning ahead of time before you die is that you haven't basically created a situation that increases the likelihood that your kids are going to be fighting, which is the last thing you want after you die. So can you just talk about what the most kind of common family feud type situations are? Well, a very common situation yeah. is when one adult sibling is left in charge. He or she is the executor of an estate, personal representative we call them now, yeah. or a trustee of a trust, and he or she yeah. has the power. And by the way, that's the same term now, executor, 
Use, it used to be called executor and executrix. Now it's personal and representative. In Massachusetts. Right. In Massachusetts. A exactly. But wearing that hat, that person is a fiduciary. And that means that that person has a dealing to treat the, an obligation to treat the other folks with good faith and fair dealing. And that that fiduciary must put aside his or her self interest. A very common situation is when some of the other beneficiaries, very often the fiduciary siblings, doesn't believe that the fiduciary is fulfilling his or her duty. He may believe that the fiduciary is putting his hand in the cookie jar and may be taking estate or trust assets for his personal use. He or she may believe that that person is not accounting, is not being forthcoming about what assets are in the estate yeah. and in the trust. and Sometimes they're right. Sometimes a fiduciary who has a little bit of power does abuse that power. I had a situation not too long ago where the fiduciary had 139 transactions between the trust account and his personal banking account. Wow. That's wrong. That's a breach of fiduciary duty. Was there any reason? How did the fiduciary, when, when, this, when this kind of came to account, how did the fiduciary explain that? Well, to his credit, he was pretty honest about it. He, he said, I took the money. I, no. Well, I, I took the money, and it was just an advance of the money that was coming to me anyways. Now, of course, that's an inappropriate way to do it, but that's the way that he rationalized it in his own mind, and it goes to show how people with sometimes a little bit of power given through a trust or an estate can uh, think all of a sudden that they're master of the universe and abuse that power. I see. And you can understand how a beneficiary, again, very often another sibling, would be very upset about now, that. just to go back to that situation, so in that case, was the fiduciary like a personal representative of an estate? And, and this was an issue that where, where, the, where the, the, there was simply other things left to be done before the th money could be divided to everybody? E exactly. And so, he, and so he was taking an advance. Now, are, now, can't beneficiaries who are going to receive things under estate, un, from an estate get an advance? Under, under, under some circumstances, that yeah. alive is allowed, but it needs to be transparent. And transparency in the administration of an estate and in a trust, that's very, very important. And that's a real important obligation of a fiduciary mm -hmm. is to let folks know within reason what's going on and to respond to reasonable requests. If you hide that, if you don't show these transfers on an account, if you delete those transfers from the account that the accountant prepared, as, was, as is what happened in this case, <laughs> um, that's wrong. Uh, so these squabbles between siblings often start when there is smoke and, and there is fire. But you can imagine, because they're sibling relationships, that they can really escalate and become very emotional so that the issues that we're dealing with are not only the legal issues about what happened to the money and yeah. did the fiduciary adhere to his or her uh, standard of duty, but what's all the other family baggage? And that's what makes these cases in many ways very challenging, but in many ways um, very interesting as well. And, and do you find that these kinds of problems occur more in an estate context, in an estate administration, or in a trust context? Uh, I find that they're very, very common in both situations. And you know, Arthur, the amount of money really doesn't matter. I've had estates that maybe are worth $50,000, $100,000, not a whole lot. Right. And I've had matters where there are several trusts involving in excess of $100 million. And at the end of the day, people are people, and the issues are very, very common, regardless of the amount of money at issue. Now, I know from my own perspective, when people call because they're starting to be concerned or they are concerned on an estate, often it's because they were expecting to get their money six months ago mm -hmm. or a year ago and nothing has showed up and they, they're not, and, and also they're not getting return phone calls from right. people. But basically they're expecting their money. So in an estate situation where Ma has died and there is a house and there's some cash and there's some various things and they're in the estate, is there a certain amount of time that you can expect you're going to have to wait before you can get any distributions? And, 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 at, and only after then should you be starting to say, so you know, what's, what's the problem here? As a general rule, it's going to be at least six months mm -hmm. after the date of death because the personal representative who's in charge of the estate must get appointed, and sometimes that takes time. And then he or she is charged with identifying what the assets of the estate are, what the liabilities of the estate are, 
and paying those liabilities if there are, are any. And uh, very often the assets must be liquidated so that they're available to be disbursements. Yeah. As a general rule, a fiduciary should not make any payments under a will uh, within that six months period uh, because there's always the chance that additional claims may pop up uh, over time. Uh, and, and really, in many cases, it's prudent for a fiduciary to wait until after a year to make disbursements mm -hmm. uh, under, under a will because that's the deadline that any creditors have to file a claim against the estate. Very often the fiduciary is aware of the universe of what the potential claims or the liabilities are yeah. and there may be sufficient assets so perhaps a partial payment uh, could be made after that six months period but generally six months to after a year. On the other hand it's not uncommon for some estates to take longer than a year for a host of reasons. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it takes some time. Any typical reasons why you, why, why you, would, you might be waiting for significantly longer than a year before you can get your distribution? Well, we're talking about family feuds. Certainly if there's a, a feud involved, if someone objected to the will, if someone objected to the appointment of the person who seeks to be the personal representative, that right. can really delay things for a very, very long time. You know, a common misunderstanding that folks have is, well, I don't like what's in this will, so I'm going to object to it. But you know, Arthur, there are really only a few reasons that provide a good faith basis for objecting to a will. Um, and you want to go over those just very briefly? Yeah. If somebody doesn't have capacity, if the legal capacity, if somebody cognitively really doesn't understand um, what his or her assets are, who his or her family members are or yeah. heirs of uh, law, then that person may not have legal capacity to execute a will. And so let's talk about that one for a sure. second. So as you know, I do elder law. So mm -hmm. I am dealing with folks, and the major reason why people talk to me is because they are concerned that they might get Alzheimer's and therefore have dementia issues. Sure or they're talking to me or one of their or their spouse or their kids are because they actually do have dementia issues and they're trying to figure things out. So, so suppose mom had dementia, right? She was forgetful uh, and then executed a will. So I've had this situation happen and then ma dies. And then, you know, child number three uh, who, who got less than child numbers one and two says, well, Ma had dementia. We all know Ma had dementia. You know, that, that new will that she drafted, that, that's no good. Can you have dementia uh, and, and still draft a, and still sign a valid will? Typical lawyer answer. You know what I'm going Guess to say. What? It depends. It depends on what? In answer to your question, it's very, very possible. The law that we all has to have to follow that's evolved through common law in Massachusetts yeah. says that even somebody who has transient legal capacity may be able to validly execute a will. Tra and now, uh, as a layman, transient legal capacity sounds like you have it while you're on a train. Or, <laughs> or no, it's, no, it sounds like one of those cases of, well, you know, my... The classic line I hear from my clients, well, you know, Ma, sometimes Ma is great, sometimes she's not so great. Good days and bad days. Good days and bad days. Sometimes morning is great, typically nighttime is crummy. So, so just kind of talk, can you talk about transient legal capacity? If the person making the will mm -hmm. um, has the capacity at the time she is making the will, that would be recognized by law. Now, how has do we determine that? Thank you. Well, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm a lawyer. So. No, go, go ahead. I do, how do too. You, how do you determine that? If at the time that he or she is making the will, she or she understands what his or her assets are, that I understand that I have a house and I've got some stocks and I've got some CDs and some bank accounts and I want the bank accounts to go to Uncle Arthur and I want the house to go to my son Jim and I want my jewelry to go to my granddaughter. If I understand that at the time I'm making my will, I can legally execute a will. Now, I may not remember what I had for lunch or later that afternoon I may be asked the same question several times, but if I understand what my assets are and my who my heirs of law, heirs at law are at yeah. that time, I can execute a will. 
it does create a challenging situation for the attorney because the attorney has to be satisfied that this person really does um, understand what he or she is doing and understand the consequences of the will and what's going to happen to his or her assets after she passes away. And that person also has to satisfy the two witnesses that are required under Massachusetts law that he or she has capacity as well. So you may be able to have capacity to sign a will, say. I'm going to give you another, another example. Yeah. I, I had another client who said, well, you know, my mother couldn't possibly have signed that will. There, she, had issued, she had executed a power of attorney and that po that, or, a, or a healthcare proxy, and that healthcare proxy was in effect, was in effect. And I, and I went back to her and, and just said to her, I said, you know, there may be a difference between whether your mother had the capacity to understand a medical diagnosis and make a decision among possible medical alternatives, operations, drugs, other things. That's a pretty complicated sure. question. Versus your capacity to understand that you own a house, you have some stocks, you want it to go to this, one, this child or you want it to go to that child. They're really, really very different. They can be different standards. And another thing that's interesting is that the capacity to execute a different type of contract, mm -hmm. such as a deed to mm -hmm. convey real estate, that's a level of capacity that's actually higher than what we call testamentary capacity, the capacity to execute a will. I didn't know that. So, see, we learned something every here day, on Ashland, every day, every Ashland day we learned something. Yeah. Cable. So, somebody could have testamentary capacity, suffer from dementia, have good days and bad days, and maybe he or she can execute a will yep. uh, giving the house to you upon her death, but perhaps she would not have the legal capacity necessary to, to convey a deed to you uh, while she is still alive. Slightly different standards, yep. and, and the courts recognize that it's important that people in their wills be able to express their wishes, and to the extent possible, uh, the court's going to try to honor those wishes, even if somebody's impaired. And that's a fascinating distinction. Now I want to go to another one of those standards. So I know whenever folks are signing the will, I'm always, I'm always saying now that I'm asking the witnesses, did you see this person sign this will? Yes. Did you hear them say... Or do they appear to you, did you hear them say, or do they appear to be signing it freely? Yes. Do they appear to be of sound mind, right? And over 18 years old. Can't sign a will if you're less than 18 That's years true. old. People, by the way, should always remember that witnesses can be under 18. It's just the person who's signing the will can't be sure. under 18. Um, so the, but on this question of whether they're signing freely, once again, I'll have folks say, well, you know, I mean, gra grandma was, you know, she may have still had most of her marbles, but you know, Sarah, her daughter, right, was there all the time, right? Ah, and was and, a new and, influence. And, and can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. One of the um, other reasons to challenge a will, in addition to claiming that Aunt Sarah didn't have um, legal capacity, mm -hmm. is to say, well, maybe she had legal capacity, but she was subjected to undue influence. <clears throat> and undue influence is something that we struggle with a, a lot mm -hmm. because people claim it a lot. And undue influence is something more than just she was maybe pressured, maybe she was re you know, requested, uh, maybe she gave in to somebody who was pestering her. Undue influence is really forcing somebody through some means to make a decision that he or she otherwise wouldn't have done. Arthur, I'm never going to visit you again unless you leave me your car in your will. Arthur, I'm never going to let you see your grandchildren unless you leave me the car. And that could actually be undue influence. It's yes. not, I'm going to beat you up if you don't sign this. So this isn't like an offer you can't refuse type undue influence. It, it, this, it could actually be as to an, between an old person and a young person. It, it could. Th this, this kind of pressure based on kind of personal stuff. Yeah, and, and the type of pressure that's certainly psycho, certainly it could be physical, yeah. um, but certainly, you know, very psychological and really preys on somebody's vulnerabilities mm -hmm. and forces them to do something that they otherwise wouldn't do. And, and I, I gather from what you're saying that, therefore, <coughs> that question of undue influence is related not only to the things being done by the influencer, 
but to the kind of state of mind at that point of the influencee, right? So that if the older person is really kind of bedridden and starting, starting to slip anyway in terms of dementia issues. And, and feeling things, very vulnerable. And feel, right. Then that, then that really could, could, would decrease the, the, the level of pressure that might be considered to be undue influence. I would think so in, in that type of a case. I see. Now the problem with undue influence cases, how do you prove it? Right. In the world that I live in, a go, very go, funny going, world. going to a very funny the world. Court, well, I always tell people, you know, there's two, in, the, tr there's two, there's real truth, and then there's the truth inside the courtroom. And that's the truth that you can prove. And that's the truth that you can prove. And how do you prove it? Well, evidence. What's evidence? Facts. What what type of facts? Well. Testament, testimony or documents. And in undue influence cases, lots of people speculate, oh, I am sure that Patty unduly influenced Arthur. I'm sure your wife Patty probably does unduly influence you sometimes, but that's a different topic. That's a different topic. I am sure. Well, okay, how do you prove it? Were you there? Do you have any witnesses? If they were the only two in the room, how do you know what happened? Was there a caretaker around who perhaps heard something, who right. per perhaps observed something? What did the decedent, the person who's now passed away, what did he tell you about what this in influencer said or how he pressured? What's the evidence and what's the quality of the evidence so that we can present it in court because we have rules of evidence that we must live by and not every little bit of information is necessarily admissible. Now when you start talking about that, I keep saying to my, I, we're on my legal, remember now I never go to court, but there's a little <laughs> voice that comes back from law school that says, hearsay, hearsay. Mm -hmm. So if I've got a dead person that I'm dealing with, yeah. right, because of course most of the evidence regarding whether the person was really being unduly influenced I would think would come from the words of the dead person who was therefore dead. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the rule was that you can't bring in testimony of somebody who is dead, that you're just recounting what they said because that's hearsay. As a general rule, that is, although you'd be surprised in my experience, most lawyers um, ignore that rule in these types of cases because both sides tend to want to offer the evidence of mm -hmm. the dead person. Mm -hmm. So there's a quid pro quo that goes on. I see. All right, I see. I'll let you introduce statements that, that you attributed to Arthur, yeah. R.I.P., as long as I can introduce statements that I attributed that to Arthur, R.I.P. So and that's judge, usually what happens. And judges will allow that? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, because and everybody wants to hear what the, what the dead person said. What the dead person said. And, and speaking of judges, in these kinds of cases, is this a Perry Mason case? Is this a case where... Uh, the jury is deciding whether grandma was crazy or not or was unduly influenced or is these or are these cases are these judge cases these are judge cases these are cases in what we call equity there's only mm -hmm. two types of cases uh, in law mm -hmm. in which people seek money damages in equity in which you ask a judge typically to do something to order somebody to do something or to yeah. not do something and asking the court for an order that somebody that a will is invalid because somebody was subject to undue influence. That's an equitable action. I see. So, so the so all of the discussion that we've been having, or the presentation that's going to be getting made, is going to be getting made to a judge and not necessarily to a jury. That's correct. And 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 presumably, I mean that's kind of good and bad news. But one of the nice things about a judge, that I always find, from the occasions that I would go, is they seem like they've heard it all before. And that's, that's good and bad in a, in a way. Uh, it's good in the sense that they're familiar with the legal issues and yeah. they have an appreciation of the dynamics and some of the underlying family dynamics that may in, be in play and that may be complicating uh, the legal issues and, and the potential to resolve the matter. It's kind of bad in a way in that nothing shocks them. And folks uh, always say to me, the judge is going to be so outraged. Well, wait till the judge hears this. Uh, and the judge is not going to be outraged yeah. because you know he or she is, has heard it all, has heard all, all the horrible things that people have done to each other. And very rarely is a judge going to turn to a bad person, a bad actor, and say, you did wrong, You're how a... dare you? <laughs> people, people want that vindication. It doesn't work that people way. People would love that vindication. Yeah. Well, listen. Thank you very, very much for all of this. I think that I think 
having people have a sense of what, how those cases work is really important. I just want to ask one other piece. Sure. We were talking about um, people getting concerned because the money hasn't showed up yet. So if the money hasn't showed up yet, and it has been a year or a year and a half, or you're just getting worried about kind of what's going on, what can people do? Well, the first thing to do is ask. Can't ask the Better Business Bureau, you know. I mean, that's well, not that's, that's not going to help this. First thing to do is ask. Um, a good fiduciary will keep beneficiaries informed of the progress of the administration of the estate. He or she doesn't have to let the beneficiaries know about everything that happens, but reasonable communication is a good thing. And as you and I know, we always recommend to our fiduciaries to do that right. because communication helps to spell all the speculation that bad things are happening. Sometimes things just take time. Uh, but if a beneficiary hasn't heard anything, well, follow up, ask the questions. Very often there'll be an attorney that will be representing the fiduciary or involved in the administration of the estate. Call that person. If there still isn't um, follow-up communication and suddenly start things start to smell bad, you can match it up and take the next step. Uh, you and I often will, will get involved in that stage and, and we'll make a phone call and sometimes, unfortunately, a lawyer will have better luck in connecting with the fiduciary or the lawyer representing yep. the fiduciary and getting some answers on the status of the estate. But, or perhaps looked at a different way. Fortunately, <coughs> when that call gets made by an attorney, people who are otherwise just brushing it off will actually pay attention and answer yeah. and answer in a way that resolves the case. Very often. So that. I guess the reason why I wanted, to, I wanted to mention that is that I know people so often have these problems, but they're desperately afraid to talk to a lawyer, or they don't want to pursue it because they're thinking to themselves, oh my God, I don't want to have to go to court, right? And I think the real, the real message for so many of these clients is, because I've seen you've solved many cases on my behalf or on my client's behalf and without going to court, but the fact that you were there is the reason why the case got solved. And as a result, the, the cost of getting the matter cleaned up, right, and getting the matter resolved wasn't a $50,000 trial type cost, but more of a much more moderate cost just in, in terms of getting the issues resolved kind of. Well, and, and coming full start. circle, coming full circle from where we started in, in the conversation, you know, yes, we do go to court and we can go to court. In some cases, merit the fight for a whole bunch of reasons. Most of the time, we're just looking to solve the problems. That's right. And sometimes you do that by making some friendly phone calls and dispelling some speculation or trying to improve communications. And that's when we best serve our clients when we solve a problem. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Bergeron Briefs. We'll be back uh, hopefully soon, probably within the next few months, with another episode. Thank you.